Buenas tardes. Quisiera hablar en español sobre la experiencia de las islas, pero hoy no es posible. Estamos en México, pero um, tengo que practicar más. Así quizás la próxima vez. ¿De acuerdo? <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us um, this afternoon. Um, my name is Judith Ephraim Schmidt. I am the Program Director for Sustainable Energy at the OECS Commission, the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States Commission. Um, if you would have taken a close look at our agenda earlier on, you'd have noticed that there have been some changes. Um, so we come from the Caribbean. This panel is really led by the Caribbean. And we are small, but we are resilient, and we are adaptable. And I think you will see a little bit of this this afternoon. So I must first apologize um, for there are some people who really wanted to be here and they were not able to join us today. So I bring you warm greetings and apologies from three persons. The first one, Mr. Joseph Williams from the Caribbean Development Bank. He can't be here, although he will be joining us virtually and I think in spirit um, due to logistical challenges. We also bring you apologies from Minister um, King, the Honorable Stevenson King from St. Lucia. He had to be called back. He was already en route, but due to some challenges back home, they had had some flash flooding, which has impacted the country in the north seriously, so he had to return. And our dear Minister from Dominica, the Honorable Vince Henderson, he too sent his apologies. He could not make it. So we do have some apologies, but let me... Um, reiterate and confirm that this doesn't in any way take away from the quality of the discussions that we will have this afternoon. I can assure you that we have an expert panel who are prepared to share. A number of persons have stepped in. And we will be looking at reimagined approaches to geothermal development for small island states. So join me in welcoming our panelists for this afternoon. We have the Honorable Dr. Samuel Joseph, the Minister of Communication, Works, Energy, and Labor from Montserrat. Welcome, Minister. We have, joining us from the Nevis Island Administration, Mr. Wakely Daniel, and he is the permanent secretary responsible for energy. Mr. Terence Gillard has stepped in to fill in the shoes, big shoes, but I'm sure that he will be able to do so successfully, of Honorable Stevenson King, and he's the Chief Energy Officer from St. Lucia. And last, but by no means least, we have Mr. Lance Peters, who is the Director for Energy in the Government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. <laughs> Gentlemen, welcome. I myself, you will see throughout the course of this discussion, I may take on more than one hat, but for now I will serve as the moderator. So as you have heard, geothermal energy really is an area that holds significant potential, not only for small islands like those of the Caribbean, but for the whole world. Much of this um, potential has not been fully utilized, and in the Caribbean, and in, indeed in small island states, it really has a long way to go. Um, within the Caribbean region, as we have seen in the video um, that we just watched, geothermal energy could really transform our landscape and provide numerous unique benefits to us, especially when we look at the small size of the islands, when we look at the need for preserving environmental integrity. So a lot of effort has been spent on geothermal energy already. And we do have very ambitious sustainable energy plans, and targets, and these are complemented by ambitious climate change related targets. Some of our, our colleagues are currently at the COP at the moment. So we expect geothermal to continue to be a priority for us. The journey has been long and we have made some progress. But as we move forward, we want to look at reimagined approaches to geothermal development for small island developing states looking at the Caribbean experience. And today we're gonna to delve into this and to see where we are, what we are currently doing, and how we hope to build on those experiences and um, successes that we have had. So we'll start first with Montserrat, and we will 
Move to Honorable Samuel Joseph. So we have noted that there's been some development with respect to geothermal energy in Montserrat. Can you share a little bit of those? And in addition, um, Montserrat is the smallest of the Eastern Caribbean islands pursuing geothermal. Um, you have a peak demand of five megawatts. Um, that is a little small, and that could impact project viability. So how would you respond to those who ask, why is Montserrat pursuing such a complex, high-risk and expensive undertaking as geothermal? And why not stick to solar and battery storage? Well, thank you, Judith. That's a very interesting question. So let's start with Montserrat. To understand the journey to geothermal, we have to understand the concept and where Montserrat came from. So in 1995, there was a volcanic eruption in Montserrat. We started with approximately 12,000 people. Due to the volcanic eruption, the population went down to 5,000 people. Most people vi migrated to the UK, to Navy, some of these other Caribbean islands. And there's this view on the island that the heat from the earth has created this destruction and it must be repaired. So it must be repaired in the sense that geothermal has created this destruction, but it can also be used back for the construction of the island. So there's this social and view of the islanders that we can transform back the island through our geothermal energy. Because right now in the energy landscape in Montserrat, we have, I think, one of the most expensive electricity rates in the Caribbean, if not the world. And if you would realize that would have a drag on development, a drag on trade and businesses, and that number has to go down. So you have to look at other methods to generate clean, reliable, stable electricity. So you ask the question, why choose such a complex, expensive technology as geothermal, not solar and wind? And if you go back to, again, the Montserrat context, you're a very small island. How much space do you have to give up from your agriculture, from other uses for building and construction to put down solar panels? You have a similar problem with wind. How, many, how much space are you willing to give up to get wind implemented and to put the infrastructure in place for all of that. So when you consider all of those, it does come out that geothermal is the best way to get it done because it's stable, it's more reliable, and has been pointed out by some of the previous panelists. It's also a climate change adaptation and just mitigation. It works in the day, it works in the night, it's a stable base load that's always there, and it also have other uses, as we have seen from this morning, not just from the electricity side, but also from the direct use side in order to generate economic activity from the island, which is what we're looking for. Not only to generate electricity for the, the magma under to repay its debt back to Montserrat in terms of generating back economic activity, but also on the direct use side to bring other industries so that the island can be more financially independent from where it's currently at. Thank you, Minister. You certainly made a case. Um, so let's move over to another small island, um, part of a, a bigger country, but nevertheless a small island, Nevis. Um, Mr. Daniel, we have a strong delegation from Nevis at this GEOLAC, which I think shows heightened interest in geothermal, very promising. Can you provide an update on your recent geothermal energy efforts? And one question that has been on many people's minds, the last successful drilling was in 2008, 14 years ago. Hopes were very high um, due to the potential impact. Is there still strong public support for geothermal energy in Nevis? Yes, but let me go back a bit and um, give you a, a brief history. I think our, our geothermal journey would have begun somewhere around 2004 with the assistance of the OECS. Um, four years later, 2008, we would have drilled three wells. In 2017, we did another, which took us up to four wells. And they all gave indication that Nevis has a, an excellent geothermal resource. Well, along the way, we would have had, we would have had two companies, uh, West Indies Power and REI, but those companies did not take us to where we thought we are to be today. So what we did is that in recent times, we have pivoted a bit in that we would have collaborated with the Caribbean Development Bank along with the IDB, and they would have offered us what they call a, well, a contingent recoverable grant, um, grant slash loan. And what this has done is that this has pushed our geothermal quest 
uh, much further. It has breathed new life and new energy into our geothermal prospects. Uh, our plan going forward, of course, is to have five wells, three productive production wells and um, two injection wells. We are hoping to have that by June of 2023. And of course, we are hoping to have a 30 megawatt plant uh, distributing electricity as early as 2025, 2026. So I think that we are on a good path and we are on our way and we are much further than we were back in 2004. Now, the second part of the question you asked was if... Public support. Yes, there's still strong public support. But like everything else in life, there would be the skeptics and there would be the cynics, of course. Oh, you've been talking about geothermal for such a long time. We have not seen it. But okay, the majority of the population in Davis, they are pretty patient. And we must thank them for their patience. But in recent times, you would understand what has happened on the world scene. The price of oil going up, everything's being affected. Um, inflation is taking over, the, the price of electricity going up. So I think people more and more, they're now understanding that if, when we move towards geothermal, when geothermal becomes a reality, all of this would be taken, would, you know, would be taken care of. We would no longer be held hostage by um, outside influences. We would have stable electricity, um, the price would be set, and of course their life, their general life, their general quality of life would be much better. So I think that, yes, there's still much interest in Nevis in the geothermal. Thank you, Mr. Daniel, and it's, it's good to know. So we'll move over to St. Lucia, and Mr. Gillard, I think you have a similar experience in St. Lucia, perhaps even longer in terms of the development process, um, but you've taken some significant strides of late. Um, can you share what your country has been doing recently? And with respect to drilling, um, the drilling in the past, although you had success, it did not allow for moving forward. I know that there has been some recent moves towards drilling. How is it gonna be different this time? What are the new strategies that are being employed to ensure that you, know, you have a more successful outcome? Thank you for the question, Judith. Um, primeramente yo quiero agradecer al gobierno de México y también a los organizadores de este, esta conferencia tan importante que es que nosotros le um, aplicamos mucha importancia a, a, a tales discusiones. St. Lucia's geothermal history, as you rightly indicated, um, Judith, it, it has a, a very storied past. Um, the interest in direct use goes back centuries where, where there, was a, there, there are um, records of a colonial army um, using the, the mineral baths because of, of the, the, the healing effects that, 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 that they felt it had and the refreshing um, effects it had on the army so, so that they could have continued their, um, their, their engagements with, with um, the adversaries. Moving forward in, 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 re, in relation to, to power generation, um, interest started in 1951 with, with the first uh, a UN mission and, uh, you know, incidentally, the investigator, the researcher who came to St. Lucia happened to be Icelandic. So he prepared the first report and following that, on, on this basis, additional studies were done leading to exploration, drilling, drilling, sorry, in the 70s and the 80s, but um, these studies did not validate the field characteristics necessary to con confirm commercial viability of a, a geothermal resource for power generation. And there was a lull. Um, in 2014 to 2016, through support from, from the World Bank and the government of New Zealand, we were able to, to, to conduct some surface exploration work which indicates um, the presence of a geothermal reservoir outside of the original area of interest, and, and you did ask about that, Judith. The original area of interest is what we call the Sulphur Springs in St. Lucia on the southwestern portion of the island, which happens now to fall within a World Heritage Site, which we call the Peter Management Area. And of course, um, the sort of activities that can take place within that World Heritage Site is, 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 is controlled. So there, there are limitations on, on, on the, the types of activities that could take place. So it was felt that geo, geothermal exploration drilling would be best outside of that area, which is what the surface exploration um, results of um, 2014 to 2016 indicate. So on that basis, 
a pre-feasibility study um, for a geothermal exploration drilling campaign was prepared, as well as an environmental, social, and impact assessment report, which Anne referenced earlier, um, highlighting the major environmental and social risks and also putting in place a management plan for, for dealing with, with these risks. These documents were prepared. And from that, uh, a, a financing package of 22 million US dollars was structured, comprising um, highly concessional um, financing and grant financing from governments of the UK, the Clean Technology Fund, um, the Government of Canada, and of course from the World Bank to pursue a geothermal exploration drilling project in St. Lucia to drill three to four slim hole wells in the southwestern portion of the island, but outside of that ecologically and culturally sensitive area um, that, that we have, um, Judith. So this is where we are. So the, the project has, has started. It's a four-year project. Um, and we're in the process of um, procuring the exploration management consultancy firm. So, so this is where, where we are right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Darren. So we'll move to St. Vincent. Lance, you may not have had such a long period of exploration in St. Vincent. Um, you've been able to do quite a bit within the short space of time since you started. But St. Vincent recently experienced a volcanic eruption. And this would have disrupted your plans, including those of geothermal. Can you share where you are now in terms of your geothermal activity and indicate whether geothermal energy is still a priority for the government of St. Vincent. Okay, thank you, Judith. So, first of all, I'll start with the last question. Sin, um, geothermal exploration is still on top of the government of St. Vincent and the Greater Needs agenda, solely then because, as we can see what is happening in today's world with high prices, geothermal, as indicated, is one of those indigenous energy resources that we have that we are trying to develop to make St. Vincent and Grenadines a bit more energy secure. So definitely geothermal continues to be a priority on the government's agenda. However, I'll give some backstory as to from where we started and where we are currently. So in early 2019, that is when exploratory work had begun on the geothermal resource that we, had in, that we have in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So in the area which you would have seen in the previous videos, um, that area is called the Orange Hill Bamboo Range area. It's basically on the flank of the La Soufre volcano. And in April of 2019, that's when the first well was dug. A, went to a depth of almost three kilometers and followed the second well on the 7th of August, same 2019, and the final well was done in November of 2019. Both three of, well, the three of those wells all were close to three kilometers. Unfortunately, at the end of that exploratory process, we did not achieve the type of permeability that we were looking for. There were extremely good temperatures. We had temperatures ranging between 250 degrees to around 260, 70 degrees. So the heat, we had that, those temperatures. However, when looking at the data, it basically showed that the fractures were not so porous. So we had to go back to the drawing board to see how we could utilize what other technologies that are available. So um, in conjunction with the St. Vincent Geothermal Company, we started to explore other alternatives and that led us to exploring a closed loop technology approach, which is basically injecting a fluid, working fluid within the well, at least selecting two of the wells, injecting a fluid, and because of the high temperatures that we have, that fluid would be heated and then rise to basically come back to the surface on the next well. As we were exploring this new technology, in April of last year, we had a volcanic eruption. And that in itself lasted around 
five to six weeks. Within that period of time, there were 33 eruptions. So you could have imagined 33 eruptions that could have definitely changed the whole geological landscape of the Lasso Frey area. So currently what we are doing is basically doing a post-volcanic study to reassess to see if new fractures may have opened. And there are lots of indications that new fractures may have opened. But again, we have to do this post-volcanic study to reassess the whole geothermal area and ultimately make a decision in terms of utilizing whether the closed loop technology or going back to the natural way of exploring geothermal energy. So at this stage, we are still doing our post-volcanic study to reassess the area, and then an ultimate decision would be made in terms of going forward. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lance. So I, I think all the countries represented here, here has, have made a good case for geothermal within the island context in the Caribbean. Um, they have updated us, which shows that there's still interest. But we are no closer in terms of having geothermal energy from the ground onto the electricity grid. Guadeloupe is the only island in the Caribbean which still has which has this currently. Minister Joseph, what do you think are the critical missing pieces for accelerating geothermal energy in the Caribbean? And some have suggested that the lack of political will has been a major factor slowing the pace of geothermal energy in the Caribbean. I think you may be the best placed <laughs> on this panel to offer a response. How do you respond? Uh, I don't fully agree with your statement that there hasn't been progress, because as my good friend here, Von Nevis, pointed out from 2004, some changes were made, and they have made some progress along that end. And in terms of Montserrat, if you look at the graphs that were given before in terms of the risk analysis for geothermal projects, it's the actual drilling where the highest risk is, because you may spend money on drill, and you do not get the resource that you want. In Montserrat's case, that was financed by the UK government, so we do already have two production wells drilled, and we do already know that we can get up to three megawatt capacity from them. So that is already there. The government is, of Montserrat is also working on the legal framework in a Geothermal Resource Act, so that all the bidding parties who want to access this resource know what they need to do. We have also, in the process sometime this week, we'll release a tender document for the, product, the development of the surface plant to take advantage of those two wells, those two production wells to move into, as you pointed out, to actually get electricity into the grid. And I just realized that we're in a race here with Nevis for 2025 to see who first do that production well. And in terms of political will, the question is political will from whose side? Because if you look at what's happening in terms of energy prices, they have gone through the roof. All the other, all the OECS countries are spending a huge amount of resources to import energy into their country. That is placing tremendous fiscal burden on governments. Even in governments, electricity bills and utility bills, they're very high. And we're taking money away from roads, education, and health in order to fund importing these fossil fuels. So the political will from our small island states still exists to move away from fossil fuel production into a more renewable energy side. So the question is, what are the constraints and where does the political why hasn't you seen more progress? Right now, we know we are in COP27 period, and there are a lot of talks happening. And it's a curious thing that happens in every COP27. The scientists come out, and they claim that they say, and we'd all agree, that the world is warming and something needs to be done. Then the leaders of the rich countries of the North come, and they reiterate the same thing. Things are happening, and we need to do something about it, because they need to please some of the environmental friend voters on their constituencies. So they all agree with the scientific assessment that something needs to be done. But what needs to be done is that the third world developing countries need to move away from fossil fuels into renewable energy sources and the World Banks and all these other institutions need to finance these institutions. Then the developing countries say, yes, we agree, this needs to be done, we don't have the money. Since you guys are the ones that caused the problem in the first place, your emissions, you should pay for it. They all agree that they should pay for it, that they'll produce all these funds and the money will be available. Everybody sign off, everybody shake hands, they drink the champagne and they come home. 
but the funds are not available in the end. So when you ask what is the constraint into getting this done, it is finance. If you look at a lot of the OECS countries and look at their balance sheets, the ability to finance such projects with the risk involved at the beginning does not really exist when you look at the other things that they need to do in terms of providing health care for the citizens and other such things. So finance, I would say, is the major contributing factor where we have not yet seen electricity into the grid and other direct uses, although we all agree that it needs to be done. So I would not say the political will is lacking from our small island developing states, but the political will is lacking from those who are creating the global problems in the first place. Thank you, Minister. Very interesting response. I, I think that I could also support what the good minister here would have just said. Um, finance, I think, is the Achilles heel for the small islands in the Caribbean. Uh, from the Nevis experience, we would have entertained quite a number of um, financiers. They would have come, looked at the project, and a number of them would have walked away. Perhaps, well, they would have had their reasons. The reality is the financiers are, are in the market to make money. And perhaps when they look at the size of the population and et cetera, et cetera, they figure that, well, they cannot make a big enough profit over a certain period of time. But it comes down to financing, and that, I think, would have been the, um, the biggest drawback, the, biggest, the Achilles heel, what would have stymied the, the, the progress of geothermal within the small islands. Thank you, P.S. Now, P.S., I have another provocative question. This time, I'm hoping you can help us out. Um, so the private sector, we've spoken about financing, but the private sector is seen as a critical part of, you know, the development strategy for geothermal in the Caribbean. Some suggest that the slow pace for our geothermal efforts can be directly attributed to the way that we procure private sector partners. It is not competitive and that creates issues we have protracted negotiations that often fail. How do you see this? Well, truth be told, I do think that uh, throughout the entire Caribbean, I think it can be said with regards to geothermal that, uh, well, missteps were taken. Hindsight is often give you, hindsight gives you 2020 vision, and you can look back and you can say, hmm, perhaps if I had done such and such a thing, things would have been better. One of the things that, yes, perhaps we should have have a more competitive open bidding system, which would have created competition, which would, would have created a greater quality, which would have given us the, the price and the, the, that, that we really want, would have created more innovation, etc. You see, when you have one person, or you bring one person in, into your, your market, what that person begins to think, or that company begins to think, is that they own the market. It gives you very little power, very little leverage because you're dealing with that one person. But if you have a, a, an open competition market where you can now ask for the best price, the best offer, look at their, the, what they're offering, who, who can give you the best quality, who can bring the best innovation to your project, yes, I think that there's merit to that statement, some merit to that statement. And like I said, perhaps in the past, missteps were taken. But of course, that's the beauty thing, beautiful thing about life. You can now correct it. Okay, reimagined approaches, that's what that's we're right. discussing. So Terence, we've spoken about financing, we've spoken about procurement. Um, some may argue, but we have support in the region for geothermal. We have the Caribbean Development Bank, we have the IDB, we have the EU, we have the World Bank. So if there is financing, what is the issue? Is it perhaps availability, adequacy, accessibility? What are your thoughts on those? I, I, I think I would respond um, in a couple of ways, but let me add to the discussion that Please. just took place because it has obvious implications for, for my response. What is clear is that we have a challenge of diseconomies of scale. So with Montserrat wanting to do three megawatts, um, St. Kitts, uh, they, they're talking, uh, yes, we're talking about 30 megawatts in St. Lucia, St. Vincent, I don't think it, 10 to 15. This is very small. So we have to initiate that discussion as a region on different approaches for dealing with our dis dis economies of scale. And perhaps it would be best to take place within 
the framework of harmonization of this whole drive for energy transition in the region. We've tried it in the past. There's been very little interest, but we have, to, we have no choice. The reality is our countries are very small, our markets are very small. We rec some of us have recognized the need to reform our energy markets because most of our countries are dominated by one monopolistic, vertically in integrated utility that controls the entire energy electricity value chain, which does not give space for much private sector participation. And again, I must um, commend the World Bank for working with us very progressively in structuring our renewable energy sector development project because it also looks at the issue of strengthening the enabling environment for increased investment by the private sector um, in, in the energy sector. I think this, this is very important because we do get expressions of interest we do get firms, credible firms, who have the financial wherewithal to make these investments, but in some of our countries, the regulatory frameworks are not at the stage they, they need to be to get these investors active on the market and to keep their interest and to establish that level of credibility in the, in the market that we have been able to do, for example, in the telecoms market and in the offshore banking market through very strong regulation. So I think this is where we have to go in order to address those gaps that, that we see. Harmonization of our whole drives for energy transition, our energy markets to address the diseconomies of scale, the legislative and the policy gaps. Let's move quickly to address these. And of course, I would not leave it out. We have institutional, technical, and human resource capacity gaps that we would have to address. And the harmonization would, in part, address some of these because we'd be better um, placed to share the resources that, that, that we have. Yes, we speak to St. Vincent, but if we have resources that we can deploy and, and further their, 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 um, their ambitions, it works best for all of us. We could procure um, new generation jointly, attract better PPA prices and so on. So I think that's the, the direction we, we, we need to seriously consider. Okay, thanks, Terence. And Lance, um, just to round us off, I don't know if you want to comment on this, but we also see a question here. So. I will pose that question to you in terms of, has your country taken any steps to address the competitive procurement of finances for geothermal energy through a legislative framework? You free to pick in a question to begin with. Okay, um, as the question basically says, has the government of St. Vincent taken any legislative steps? Yes, we have. And yes, we are continuing to take other steps such being as um, in, when we had first done the, the our Geothermal Resource Act, that basically that act in itself has different frameworks which governs what type of institution, what type of company should, um, companies that can bid on certain projects, what type of um, procurement measures they can use, and it basically has an outline as what steps should be followed. So we would avoid different, um, some of the, um, some of the um, my friend mentioned here in terms of just receiving certain types of um, bids that are unsolicited, and it would help to create and foster stronger competitive bidding. Okay, um, Terence, I sense you want to add to that. Yes, and I would like to indicate that St. Lucia is in the process of taking steps. We have a very advanced uh, draft legislation that deals with the energy sector as a whole, but it has implications for um, geothermal. And the, the idea is we have already set up an, an independent multi-sector regulator that's responsible for um, renewable energy regulation that also includes geothermal, and that agency will be given the responsibility for oversight of a procurement process that's competitive, it's transparent, it, has, it follows all the, the, the generally accepted principles of proper public procurement based on um, an integrated resource and resilience plan that would be developed and that would be um, operationalized. So this is, this is where um, the thinking of St. Lucia, the direction it's going in, so absolutely yes. Minister? And as as St. Vincent pointed out, Monsat also has a geothermal resource acting draft. It's on the legislative agenda. 
we should be passing this legislative year. It does the same thing to say who can bid, what permits they can get, and all of that stuff is there. So we'll have a legal framework of how that it should be done. Also, when we're now going out to bid for the development of the plant, there was a full document that was developed in association with OECS, the Foreign Commerce and Development Office, FCDU, and other agencies that we work with to develop a full procurement document so that it goes out in an open, tender process to get back the bids that will be evaluated to avoid some of the missteps that we have seen taken place before and you don't want to repeat. Thank you. And um, our last question, I think, for this session before we move to our second component of the panel. Um, I don't know who wants to take it on. Um, what are the challenges and potential solutions you see in terms of disaster and climate change risk assessment and management in geothermal projects? Um, perhaps you want to take a stab at it, Lance? <laughs> Any challenges? Definitely, there are lots of challenges um, when trying to develop a geothermal project. Um, in our case, last year, when, well, I'll most speak to the volcanic eruption because that in itself um, had taught us a lot of lessons and just the location of where the plant was supposed to be constructed. Um, I'll even backtrack a little bit more. Based on our geological records of when we had volcanic eruptions, it was not forecast, if I may use our word, that we would have had an eruption in the next um, 40 or so years. So we were more or less 20 years earlier. So that in itself taught us a lesson, taught us a lesson that things sometimes don't always go the way that you may plan. And if that plant were already constructed, there would have been dire consequences in terms of the type of um, destruction that might have happened to that plant. So strategizing now and basically looking at steps, where do we construct a plant has to be taken into consideration. Also, Right now, because of the heavy rainfalls that is happening in this hurricane season, we have been suffering from a lot of laha flows. That is a lot of the ash that is mixed with the water that comes off of the mountain. And it is causing a lot of havoc within the rivers, and most of those rivers are close to those geothermal sites. So we can see for the next maybe three to four or even five years, that in itself would cause a lot of problems with those laha flows that we're experiencing. And I think Montserrat can even speak to that as well when they had the eruptions of those laha flows. So we see with the change in the climate, it definitely would impact, at least from the St. Vincent's perspective, how we plan to develop our geothermal resources. Thanks, Lance. And I, I think it points out to a, a point that was made this morning, I think it was by Andy Blair, that geothermal projects are national projects, so they have to be considered in the whole context of overall national development. And I, I think, for instance, we have the case of Dominica, who I know recently had to redesign their geothermal infrastructure plans to accommodate for resilience. We speak about sustainable energy, which is an important part of our national development. And within sustainable energy, we have to look at energy resilience, and not only from the diversification of our energy mix, but also from ensuring that the infrastructure, particularly the renewable energy infrastructure that we are promoting is solid, it's robust, and it can you know, stand out to the, the natural disasters that we expect to be impacted by. Um, P.S. Wakely. Yes, I, I want to um, give my two cents on the question where we ask about the potential solutions to disaster and climate change. Uh, I've often said that we, here in the Caribbean, we live in a um, hurricane tunnel, hurricane country. Each year we have to brace ourselves to, because are we going to get a category five this year? Are we, we going to get a category three? And they just keep coming fast and furious. And I think that one of the things about geothermal is that it, it has shown itself to be resilient compared to the other forms of energy. 
uh, windmill. You pr probably, if you're a hurricane, it can blow them down or you have to take them down. Uh, same thing with solar. You have to take up the panels, take things like those. But geothermal, once you build that factory, uh, you know, it, 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 it can stand the test of time, it can stand the weather. I think um, worldwide it has shown that even in the, in the disaster situations, uh, geothermal plants would have stand the test of time. With regards to climate change, well, we know it's clean energy. It is clean energy, and it helps to solve the problem that we're experiencing with climate, um, with, with global warming, etc. So all in all, I think that it's a win-win with regards to the geothermal projects. Okay. So we'll take our last question um, before we move to the presentation. Have your previous geothermal evaluations looked at harvesting all the value from the geothermal value chain, including solution mining of critical minerals? Um, yes or no? We, we have, in Monsa case, we have looked at it. An analysis was done on the material in terms of lithium and other things that's needed for electric vehicles production, whether there's a capacity to actually mine it to produce that. The data is there from the geologists of how it's done. We are also trying to collaborate with some universities in the UK to do a full evaluation of whether it's at the current wells that you want to do it or whether another area in which you can mine those materials in terms of a green mining mechanism to extract lithium and other such critical minerals. So Monsat has looked at that and is currently looking at whether mine is something we should look forward to in the future to add to the value chain from geothermal. Okay, thank you, Minister. I think at this point we will pause for the panel and we will take a presentation. So I will be shifting hats, if you would permit me. <laughs> okay, I think, ladies and gentlemen, we've had a bit of the Caribbean experience and we have heard from them in terms of some of the challenges that they have faced, um, some of the proposed solutions. We heard a bit about financing, about capacity, about for the need for addressing the issues of economies of scale. And we thought we at the OECS Commission, together with the Caribbean Development Bank, and together with our team from the Caribbean, thought that the ninth GEOLAC was an excellent opportunity for us to introduce to you, the Latin American geothermal stakeholders, and to others um, joining us perhaps, a brand new, bold initiative that seeks to address, um, through a soft launch of our GeoBuild project, building people, institutions, and processes for geothermal energy. So this initiative is really aimed at responding to some of the challenges that has been already discussed. Um, could you go to the next slide? Okay, so we understand in terms of capacity, the goals for our region, there is need for increased trained personnel because this is a relatively novel undertaking for us within the Caribbean. We have already cited the need for improved regulatory processes, those that support, for instance, competitive procurement and ensure that the interests of all our stakeholders are, are, have been addressed. The need for strengthening institutions for managing geothermal, both from a scientific as well from a project management perspective. And given our small scale, a need for regional co coordination and collaboration. Next slide, please. So in terms of the specifics, the project is funded by a technical grant by the Caribbean Development Bank to the tune of 3.1 million US dollars. It is expected to be, to be a three-year project and it is being implemented by the OECS Commission. Next slide. The overall objective is to provide specialized advisory support, analyses, and capacity building for geothermal energy in the beneficiary countries. Now, our beneficiary countries, next slide, are as follows. The Commonwealth of Dominica, Grenada, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Now we do recognize that these are not all our geothermal countries within the OECS, but we are hoping that we will create some linkages between this project that would also benefit the entire region. Next slide. The project, as I said, was formulated on the articulated needs and in continued consultation with our member states. 
And the approach that we have adopted is a make, fix, and buy, as has been used in countries such as New Zealand, essentially trying to create a cadre of professionals that will give us the skills that we need, where we have professionals that have some basic training, continue to enhance those through innovative solutions um, whilst they're on the job, and where we need expert expertise um, that are not um, available in our region, highly specialized expertise that is, um, we would buy them. Next slide. So we have some linkages to our sustainable development goal, again, recognizing the importance of geothermal in the national context. So of course, those that relate to climate change and sustainable energy, as well as gender equality, industry, innovation, and infrastructure, because we expect that this will not only support the electricity sector, but as we have seen, direct use is really um, growing, and we expect that this is also going to be an important part of our geothermal energy, our geothermal resource development strategy for the Caribbean. Next slide. We have four components. The first one looks at capacity building for planning, exploration, and project management. The second looks at enhancing policy, legislative, and environmental, and the regulatory environment, sorry, for geothermal. The, four, the third looks at knowledge management and public awareness, something we see that is very critical, especially when you go into regions that have not had a lot of experience with geothermal as ours, or where you have a very long incubation period for those projects. And the fourth one looks at regional coordination and sharing for geothermal energy. I will delve a little more into those specifically. Next slide. So in terms of the capacity building for planning, exploration, and project management, the project aims to support um, those beneficiary countries through technical and, and advisory support for exploration, production, injection, drilling activities, and power production. So this would, for instance, involve looking at our technical reports, providing support in terms of the technical approaches and the other engineering and scientific aspects related to geothermal energy. And of course, providing specialized training and institutional strengthening for geothermal exploration and project management. As we have seen, the countries have had some experience, but we have had to rely on external sources. And whilst we do understand that we need to continue to do so, we need to simultaneously augment our national capacities um, to support geothermal. Next slide. A very important component of project, geothermal energy project development has to do with the economic analysis, which we find in our region is still lacking. Although we have been building our capacity in terms of the science and the engineering aspects, when it comes to economic modeling and understanding the real benefit of geothermal in terms of national economy, um, there is still some work to be done. So this project will support the economic analysis including the quantitative and qualitative assessment for geothermal projects. Um, part of this will involve the development of, an, of a financial and economic model for analyzing and assessing geothermal energy projects that can be used by the countries. And this will help guide on strategic engagements and partnerships for implementation of the recommended models. So we're hoping not only to develop our capacity in terms of the science, but also in terms of the economics. Next slide. In terms of our policy, legislative, and regulatory environment, we know that this is really key to unlocking our geothermal energy potential. So this will involve the review and development of geothermal agreements, so both existing MOUs, concessional agreements, and stakeholder agreements, and when necessary, revising them, looking at the risks that are um, existing and how we can you know, mitigate against those. Providing transactional advice and guidance, including on appropriate project structure, assessment, and selection of project, project developers, relevant contracts, and of course, the business case. And of course, reviewing the overall legal and regulatory frameworks. Next slide. And one area that we have spoken of already, um, the whole issue of environmental and social impact assessment and their contribution to geothermal ensuring that we have backstopping support and the training to ensure that those critical areas are taken care of, especially within our small island vulnerable context. Next slide. Knowledge management and public awareness. Um, this we hope to undertake through a very scientific approach, 
um, looking at um, baseline surveys and public opinion results, ensuring that we have a public relation and co communication program that is specific to our Caribbean context, um, ensuring that information is disseminated in a timely manner and that it's accurate and everything is transparent, and taking advantage of opportunities to build synergies with um, education and, and other sectors in terms of developing workshops, consultations, and discussions, and of course, a range of media products that would support our knowledge management and awareness. Next slide. In terms of the final aspect, regional coordination, we do understand um, that our countries are small and we don't expect that in any one island you would have all the resources available. But we do know that we have. We have had some ad hoc training, and in some cases, those capacities become lost. If they're not engaged, um, actively, persons may get other opportunities in various fields not directly related to geothermal. So we really want to capitalize on this and activate it and enhance it and where possible share it across the OECS. So this would of course include an analysis of what we currently have, developing a roadmap to strengthen what exists and to fill in the gaps and see where we can match those skills with the opportunities within the region. Where, where necessary, we will have short-term engagement for specialist activities, but really it's about coordinating and collaborating for increased and enhanced use of our capacity. Next slide. Um, from this, we really see this as contributing to an overall OECS geothermal energy roadmap, where you have a co coordinated approach and you have a structure and one of the deliverables from this is a virtual OECS geothermal library, which will serve to warehouse all the resources, including um, projects information, the list of experts, where persons who are interested in investing in the OECS in terms of geothermal have easy access to this. Next slide. Um, this rally will be conducted in terms of the approach um, through six consultancies. Um, the first one looks at public information and communication. The second, the legal and transactional advisory consultancy. The third one looks at engineering and technical aspects. We have one looking at the overall capacity because we expect capacity building to be a cross-cutting theme um, under all four components. The environmental and social advisor and an economic advisor. So these are the six consultancies working in tandem. We have already published RFPs and requests for expressions of interest for three of those consultancies. There are three outstanding, and if there's anybody here who's interested in um, working with us, we would encourage you to look out for those consultancies um, because we really see this as an opportunity for us to build partnerships and try to engage with the best quality um, capacity and, and expertise that we have currently. Next slide. So in terms of the implementation strategy, we are just starting. The project was actually activated in September of this year, so we are fairly new. Um, but we are hoping at this conference to do some engagement, do some visibility, ensure that we get a good sense of the priorities of our member states, develop criteria for selection in terms of the activities that we will undertake, and of course, engage the consultants to do so. Next slide. The expected result is innovative and sustainable solutions to the capacity needs and gaps with respect to geothermal energy in the Caribbean. So unique solutions for our unique circumstances. Next slide. In terms of impact, we expect to have increased technical and financial assistance for geothermal exploration and power development and to have optimized contribution of geothermal energy to the OECS energy supply mix. And finally, next slide, our ultimate goal is that clean and indigenous energy transforms and drives development in the OECS. So this is our new project, the GeoBuild project. We hope you will find some time to see um, at the table outside. If you want some more information, please approach us, and we look forward to working as the OECS Commission with the rest of the beneficiaries, the OECS, and with you to making this project a success and contributing to advancing geothermal energy in the Caribbean. Thank you.